Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers on Disney+, Plus, starring Andy Samberg and John Mulaney in a 2022 reboot directed by Akiva Schaefer, a modern-day Who Framed Roger Rabbit, packed with cameos, so let's break down some that you might have missed. The opening Disney title card of Cinderella's Castle gets zapped in the way that this movie bastardizes iconic Disney imagery into bootleg forms. Elsa's Ice Castle from Frozen, and the retro version of the castle from Pixar's Incredibles, the Sultan's Palace from Agrabah from Aladdin, and I think, I'm not sure though, Prince Eric's castle from The Little Mermaid, which we gotta talk about the design of that castle. He parks his ship right in there, got a private staircase down to a beach. I want to live in there. Then we open in 1982 when Dale mentions 18th century furniture designer Thomas Chippendale, which according to the Disney story artist Tex Henson, who drew these characters in the 40s, was the origin of their name. Now, one of the groundbreaking things about Who Framed Roger Rabbit was the way director Robert Zemeckis blended animation with live action props and gags. And right away, there's a little stunt here as the teacher pulls live action head phones off the animated kid. Then she calls out Betty for not wearing any pants like Donald Duck, which is so sad. Some cartoons have to wear pants, others don't. There's no rules. Hard to be a pubescent kid going to school. In the cafeteria, one of the kids looks like Ash Ketchum for Pokemon, another kid animated in the style of The Simpsons, Chip as a Knight Rider lunchbox. And as they become friends, they watch a clip of Abbott and Costello from the 1954 Private Eye routine where they're handcuffed, but Costello is swapped out for the character Crispy Cow, who they later have a poster for in their place in LA. We see how they book a part on Full House with the Sisters of the Scarlet Witch, that's how I will refer to them now. And we see the intro to the animated Chippendale Rescue Rangers TV series. And this movie actually brings back most of the boys' cast. Tress McNeil comes back as Gadget and Chip's chipmunk voice whenever they go into that gag. Corey Burton comes back as Zipper and Dale's chipmunk voice. Jim Cummings comes back as Fat Cat. In this movie, Eric Bana voices Monty. Now, the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit opens with one of the most insane animated to live action transitions ever in cinema from Roger's animated short revealed as a live action set painted to look like a tune. And we get a nod of that here as this movie director, a cameo by director Akiva Schaefer, yells cut on this short, we plot to reveal it as a soundstage. Right behind him is a cameo by Professor Norton Nimnall. Then onto the rap party, where we see a DH Paula Abdul dancing with MC Scat Cat from the Opposite Attracts music video. They're all dancing with the three little pigs and Roger Rabbit. Charles Fleischer actually returning to voice him. <laughs> Boy, what a party! Dale reveals he's booked a role in James Bond parody Double O Dale, airing on Har, presumably a comedy network like Comedy Central, because later on posters and billboards, we see some of these titles streaming on Horror Plus. On to the present, where Dale's convention is filled with cosplayers and cameos. Everywhere you look, there is a cameo. Every Everybody's something. I like how there are mice dressed as Princess Leia and Kylo Ren with the lightsabers. Baloo's on stage singing Bare Necessities. Looks like that's Trusty from Lady and the Tramp on sax. I love all the background movie posters. One here shows Pirates of the Great Lakes. Dale is not on the main stage. He just has a booth beside Lumiere, Marvel's Tigra. We don't see him, but the booth beside them is Kronk from Emperor's New Groove, and of course, Ugly Sonic, the pre-redesign for the 2019 trailer that freaked everyone out. Here, voiced by Tim Robinson, in my opinion, the funniest sketch actor watches Netflix series. And I love the close-up of his creepy human teeth, a few loose hairs just sticking out over the lip, and poor Tigra has to remind us of her Marvel ties because she just has a sad Avengers assemble draped over her desk. Meanwhile, Chip sells insurance to a sheep who has the same stop-motion design as Sean from the Wallace and Gromit movies. Ash Ketchum appears again behind Chip in the office, and I like the gag how he works for coercive insurance. Chip's neighbor is Mrs. House, growing up from the 1952 Disney short The Little House. In his freezer is Ice Age ice cream, Frozone food, and Looney Tunes pasta with Foghorn Leghorn on it, which is an actual product from Tyson in the 90s. Chip sees a promo for the rapping recent rebooted Alvin and the Chipmunks. Their CGI makeover is the same exact redesign Dale gets, another point of contention between these two. Monty explains what happened to poor Flounder from The Little Mermaid. How about this? Isn't it neat? <laughs> Come on, fellas, this is a genuine dangle hopper. Yeah, he uses Ariel's word for a fork. In this movie, Flounder is voiced by Rachel Bloom, wife of the co-writer Dan Gregor. Rachel Bloom actually voices a number of characters in this movie. Now, in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, the tunes feared the dip, but in this movie, it's bootlegging, wherein poor forgotten cartoons are disfigured and cast in knockoff versions of animated films. Bootleg Flounder ends up in Little Mermaid parody, The Small Fish Lady, Ariel's wearing a sports bra instead of a clam bra, and Eric has a five o'clock shadow. And you can see at the top of it, it says from the creators of Beauty and the Cursed Dog Man, a poster that also shows up in Sweet Pete's office. On the Walk of Fame, Chip passes the stars for Squidward, Yogi Bear, and Samurai Jack, later Chun-Li, and there are a whole bunch of parody movie posters. Fast and Furious Babies, Rated R, President Dog 3, then Meryl Streep is Mr. Doubtfire, same family, new imposter, Batman vs. E.T., a Gucci ad with Dobby from Harry Potter. Chip later watches Batman vs. E.T. E.T., forgive. 
Fine. Yeah, E.T. was voiced by Akiva Schaefer, Batman by Lonely Island collaborator Jorma Tacone. Now, it is not called out explicitly, but Dale's play is actually an erotic dance club, specifically based on that guy's bow tie, Chippendales. At the crime scene, one of the LAPD cars has the design of the Pixar Cars universe, same as the one that Dale's car bumper almost hits. Inside, we see the donut cops from Wreck-It Ralph, and we meet Chief Putty, voiced by J.K. Simmons, an original character, but later described as a low-rent Gumby, his knockoff nature being a clue to his true motives. As they drive on the Sunset Strip, we see more great billboards Ways the movie, Johnny Bravo Fitness, The Butter Boys, and then Nickelodeon's Doug as a law firm, Funny and Porkchop. Your injury is not funny. Dale's plate reads Vip Monk, VIP Monk. Now, as they approach Main Street, some of the graffiti in the background is Miles Morales' Expectation Street art from Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Onto Main Street, that I'm pretty sure it's just Main Street USA at Disneyland. We see a Colonel from 101 Dalmatians in the window blowing bubbles, and then Linda from Phineas and Ferb selling cupcakes. We see Wart and Meps, Fat Cat's henchmen from Rescue Rangers in the background. That Flower Girl, who's also voiced by Rachel Bloom, is designed to at least look like one of the Sugar Rush racers in Wreck-It Ralph. And then shopping for a chipmunk wig is Mr. Natural, a real deep cut, a 60s Zen master figure. We meet Bjornsson, the cheese seller, a Muppet like the Swedish chef, voiced by Keegan-Michael Key. Inside, there's one rat with a scarf who just really savors the cheese, looking a lot like Remy from Ratatouille. Bjornsson yells at an off-screen Lester, no more free samples, which could be a nod to Lester the Lab Rat in Beekman's world. In the truck, Chip references Jessica Rabbit from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And then onto the Uncanny Valley, which is a pretty clever reference for LA locals because the valley is what we call the suburban industrial and dead San Fernando Valley. I mean, no offense, man. I, I lived there for nine years and I love it. It's really the best place to live in LA. Fight me on that. I mean, have fun with your cool Los Feliz, but we don't get like random brownouts up there. Meanwhile, of course, the Uncanny Valley is a term that you've probably heard a lot lately for animation design and robotics design and CGI, design that tries to simulate human characteristics too well and that just comes off as creepy. In this, we see the cats from the 2019 live action cats, an NPC walking into a hydrant, and then Seth Rogen shows up, playing another example of the creepy Uncanny Valley design, Bob, parody of Gimli from Lord of the Rings, but with lifeless Polar Express eyes. Polar Express being a common example of this effect. Polar Express and Who Framed Roger Rabbit, both Robert Zemeckis productions. The guy is a visual genius. It's just some of his later forays to push the limits of animation technology have been a bit less well received. Looking at you, welcome Marwin. Sweet Pete's factory melts down unsold merch, including Shrek body wash into porta potties. Will Arnett voices the movie's villain, Sweet Pete, a middle-aged version of the Disney Peter Pan. He has Captain Hook's ship in a bottle, and he says Bangarang, the Lost Boys battle cry in Hook. He later crows like a rooster saying Kookaroo. His polar bear thug, Jimmy, is voiced by Dennis Haysbert, who also voices the less squeaky version of Zipper in this movie. He is clearly a Coca-Cola polar bear, like notice his Christmas vest, but it looks like they were not able to get the rights from Coke, because later they have that meta joke of you owe me a non-brand specific cola. Here he's reading Toons magazine. On the back is Pepe Cologne for Pepe Le Pew. Pete talks about his own aging and obsolescence, leading him turning out knockoffs of classics like Flying Bedroom Boy. He won't get old. Beauty and the Dog Man with a freaky Mrs. Potts and a knockoff Cogsworth. And then Jasper, the dead ghost kid, as well as Spaghetti Dogs from the creators of Lion Wooden Nose Toy Boy. Pete's story actually mirrors the tragic real life story of Bobby Driscoll, a Disney child actor who provided the voice and the appearance of 1953's Peter Pan, but once this poor kid hit puberty, he was cruelly dropped by the studio, and as he got older, he got addicted to narcotics and then died at the age of 31. Now, most of the big Hollywood studios have horror stories just like this, and this movie's got some nerve for working it into Sweet Pete's backstory, but like the way Who Framed Roger Rabbit really exposes LA's history of redlining and the real estate wars of the 40s, this movie exposes other ways Hollywood was built on broken dreams. And while escaping in the sewer, they grab onto the hair of a doll, but it's Rapunzel from Tangled, so the hair just lets out further and further until the head just completely pops off. You like how Chip flies up through the pipes? Buried underground above him is a skeleton that kind of looks like the Simpsons Angel skeleton from the Lisa the Skeptic episode, and they pop out beside a Lego Miserables billboard. Ellie tells a story about a bogus raid that she led in the past to a Nick Jr. studio about how Paw Patrol attacked Sergeant Henderson so he can't have kids. Later, Putty mentions getting attacked by Rugrats and makes another call out to Peppa the Pig. Dale shows off his garage that's filled with merch, including fireworks from the Disneyland Parade. This is all actual Chip and Dale merch, including the Capcom Nintendo game, and they mention episodes of Catteries Not Included, Throw Mummy Off the Train, and Dirty Rotten Diapers are all actual episodes of the Rescue Rangers series. And the lamp on the desk is, if you look at the label, a Pixar Luxo lamp. Dale says the Monty Pog had a cloud that looked like 
Oprah. And if you're a 90s kid like me, you know that this is a nod to the claims that Disney artists hid some sexual imagery in The Dust of the Lion King and Triton's Castle in the Art of the Little Mermaid poster. Then in the bathhouse are more cameos, Randy Marsh from South Park, Scrooge McDuck, animals that I assume are the live action Jungle Book animals. And then the snake, DJ Herzog, voiced by Flula Borg. He plays a remix of the actual Disney Afternoon theme music in Pete's Locker is a bottle of Moana macadamia nuts. Onto the San Pedro Lab, showing drawings of the characters they bootlegged, including poor Jiminy Cricket turned into a snail, Syndrome from Incredibles given Sideshow Bob hair, Flounder given lips, Gus Gus from Cinderella given a bigger nose, Felix the Cat made thinner, it looks like, Sneezy given ears, Garfield given huge muscles, and then to the left of that, we see the name Foghorn, and then something about two heads. Now the machine scans Chippendale into different animation styles. First, it looks like Mercer Mayer's Little Critter, also some anime style, Rick and Morty, and then classic UbiWorks era Disney, Simpson style, Archie and Jughead, a Batman and a Deadpool, Ren and Stimpy, and it looks like the Disney Robin Hood. You know those low set hips and that casual sexy lean? One of the lasers turns Chip's ear into a Snoopy ear. Then they see a horrifying wall of harvested bootleg parts, including Monty's mustache, Jiminy Cricket's hat and umbrella, Pikachu's tail, the mouth of Ickus from Ariel Monsters, the Mad Hatter's hat, Jimmy Neutron's hair, a Smurf hat, Rocky the Squirrel's cap, the Pink Panther's mouth, Mr. Potato Head's body, the Keyblade from Kingdom Hearts, a gloved Mickey hand, and Bartok the Bat's ears. Probably even more horrifying stuff. Outside there is a 3D reporter. Actually later we see the channel's 3D Chiron with some amazing jokes in the ticker. Little Drummer Boy indicted on 14 counts of money laundering. Barney the Dinosaur starting a new religion on Wisconsin farm. At the LAPD there's Scruff McGruff in the quarter. And actually later you can see Detective Flores from John Mulaney's other animated show, Big Mouth on Netflix. Outside on the sidewalk there's a bench ad reading, vote Senator Butthead to get tough on bootleg laws. Obviously from Beavis and Butthead. Now back at the convention, Paul Rudd cameos, claiming originally Ant-Man was Aunt-Man. There's a ton more cosplayers here. They get caught in a stampede of My Little Ponies. Jimmy pushes past a pickle Rick and then grabs the Lost Boy Cubby from Peter Pan. Chip and Dale hide under He-Man and Skeletor's table. Chip grabs the disguise, but just grabs Indiana Jones gear as Chip's look was based on Indy, while Dale's shirt was based on Magnum P.I. More cosplayers, including Borat and Miguel from Pixar's Coco. They climb up a Voltron. Bob hits his head and sees Seth Rogen's other animated characters. Pumbaa from the 2019 Lion King, Bob from Monsters vs. Aliens, and Mantis from Kung Fu Panda. What are you looking at? Honestly, your weird dead eyes. <laughs> they are weird. <laughs> Super weird. <laughs> so funny. And later when he gets arrested, Bob claims Jack Skellington has been embezzling from his own charity for years. Pete's torture tools include a jar of dip that was the acid wash from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Love that, making a cameo here. Ellie's able to tip off Dale with the plot of the episode of Rescue Rangers When You Fish Upon a Star. He's able to reunite with Gadget and Zipper. Chris Parnell, the voice of Jerry from Rick and Morty, cameos as Dale's agent, Dave Bolinari. Dale uses a firework with Mickey's Fantasia hat to blast into the lab, and later it explodes into a Mickey's head shape with the When You Wish Upon a Star music. The machine explodes and zaps Jimmy into one of the Sleeping Beauty fairies, and then zaps Pete into a horrifying monstrous form. One leg a Transformer, one leg the leg of Woody from Toy Story, one of his arms, Wreck-It Ralph arm. He's wearing Mickey Mouse's short pants. Looks like he's got Shredder's shoulder armor. His other arm looks like it's based on the cannon arm Mario, and he has the face of Marie from Aristocats. They they flee through the bootleg movie sets, including Pooch the Fat Honey Bear, a bootleg Simpsons that actually kind of looks like Matt Groening's original designs from the 80s, a bootleg Aladdin starring Pete from Goof Troop, Jim Cummings voicing him here, along with Darkwing Duck in the mid-credit cameo. They glide magic carpet away, and Pete roars after them, the banner dropping in front of him, just like it did for the T-Rex in Jurassic Park. Meanwhile, Ellie battles Putty, who seeps under the door with the same sound effect as he 1000 in T2 Judgment Day. and Ellie freezes and shatters them, similar to how they initially stopped the T-1000, but this is the final blow to Putty, unlike it was for the T-1000. On the docks, there's a sign for Nine Men or Ninemen Boat Shop, which is a deep cut nod to the Disney Nine Old Men, who famously helped shape Walt Disney's iconic animation style. They plot to drop the bundle on Pete as they did a Fat Cat in episode 325. That was the episode they were shooting in the opening of this movie. And then Ugly Sonic shows up with the FBI, but Pete breaks free for one last shot, just like the die-hard action movie trope, but the commemorative pog that Chip gave Dale saves his life. 
So they free the poor bootleg victims, including mixed matches of lots of different characters. I saw a Boo, Donkey Kong Jr., Bigfoot from the Goofy movie with the underwear on his head, but he's dressed like Fred Flintstone. We see Patrick Starr, Zazu from Lion King, Woody Woodpecker, Gus Gus, Bonkers, the Cheshire Cat, Mighty Mouse, Samurai Jack, Jiminy Cricket, Bambi, and a poor sad sneezy cradling flounder. We also see Toby the Turtle from Robin Hood, and what happened to Monty? They dumboed him. As teased in the final lines of the movie, do you think we could get like a pop star to do the theme song? Yeah, right. Like a super serious version, even though everyone just wants to hear the original. The credits feature a cover of the Chippendale theme song, in this case by Post Malone. And one of my favorite credits here was Steven Sacklid, the production designer, who you might have seen if you look closely early in the movie, he snuck his name as a director of the Fast and Furious Babies movie. Again, rated R. That plus Meryl Streep as Mrs. Doubtfire. We gotta see these at some point. But I wanna know your favorite cameo and reference in this movie. I'm sure I missed a lot. So comment down below if you spotted any others. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss. Follow Neurockstars, subscribe to Neurockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.